you for having me. I thank you for the people at Mero Eye for organizing this and uh, uh, taking care of all the details and uh, setting this up. Um, I'm going to be talking. Oh, I, I have a practice. I'm in Albany, New York. I have a picture behind me of, of New York City, but I'm about a, a, a three hour drive north of New York City and uh, uh, nearest, the nearest city here is Albany, New York, which is the capital of the, uh, the state of Albany, uh, of New, the capital of the state of New York. So, uh, um, but I used to be in a New York City area and uh, um, I have a practice that is almost exclusively a vision therapy practice right now. And uh, um, it's been that way for quite some time. We're, we're dealing and coping and working around the pandemic. It's not been fun. It's been a lot of work, but we're, we're glad to be here and glad to be open. And uh, I have a, a series of lectures. This is the first of three lectures and I'm going to be talking about um, prescribing. Uh, prescribing lenses is one of my favorite topics. I have a, uh, I actually, before I was an optometrist, I have a, I, I have had gotten a degree in engineering. So I really like physics and optics, especially. And uh, um, I, I feel there's a lot of cases that can be managed with lenses as a complement to your vision therapy program. And uh, um, what I always tell people who are new to vision therapy is, the first thing you should do is be really, really, really good at prescribing lenses because the lenses will often be a key part to moving a case along uh, regardless of whether it's a simple straightforward case or a more complex case. Um, this talk is going to be on uh, prescribing for amblyopia and strabismus. And again, it's ways to use lenses to improve your outcomes or to maybe get cases moving that you've been working with in the therapy room, but are not progressing the way that you would like. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to have good mentors. Uh, one of the ones who taught me the most about lenses was Dr. John Streff. And if you uh, don't know a lot about Dr. Streff, I, I suggest you um, look up some of his papers. I think some of them may be on the, the COVD website. They're definitely in some of the old COVD uh, journals. And uh, he really was into the use of lenses, uh, uh, not just to reduce stress, but to uh, move a case along. So um, we have some unusual cases here where I use lenses, prisms, bifocals um, in, in less than standard ways. And, and I hope you pick up uh, a, a few pearls on dealing with these patients and, uh, and uh, um, get you thinking a little differently when you prescribe lenses with these patients. So let's get talking about lenses here. Um, so we have a lot of different options whenever somebody comes into our clinic. Um, we of course have guidance, which is very important these days. Um, the school children are now spending often uh, six or eight hours a day in front of a computer. So we talk a lot about visual hygiene taking breaks, optimal distance, um, uh, and uh, things like that, and signs and symptoms that uh, parents need to look for. So uh, guidance is more important than ever. Uh, lenses, again, as optometrists, what makes us unique is the ability for us to prescribe lenses and prisms and filters. So that's the next three here. Um, there is no other profession that uses lenses, prisms, the way that we do. And it's a big part of our heritage and it needs to be carried on. Um, in the uh, United States optometry schools, they do not emphasize the use of lenses the way the optometrists use them even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it's kind of lost its way in the curriculum. And there's people here, you've, you've heard uh, my good friend, Dr. Stern talk a lot about lenses and uh, um, it's something that we can do to help our patients that nobody else can help us. It's one of the reasons we have such success is it's our use of lenses and, uh, and to a lesser degree, the use of prisms. Um, occlusions and filters, again, um, we do a lot of selective occlusion and tints and filters, especially with the brain injury population. Um, hopefully you guys know uh, about uh, binasal occlusion. 
uh, but also just even very light five and 10% uh, tents, uh, be it uh, blue, rose, uh, turquoise, um, can have a tremendous effect on helping you move along your, uh, your TBI patients as well. And uh, uh, I have a feeling you, you've uh, had some lectures on brain injury and vision as well. And then lastly, though, this is not uh, the, the course today. Um, vision therapy is, is a huge, huge tool. Uh, we're here to learn more about vision therapy. We're gonna talk about lenses to complement and make your therapy more effective. But uh, vision therapy allows us to work on uh, accommodation, convergence, eye movements, spatial concepts. Uh, part of our therapy program is, uh, is syntonics or optometric phototherapy. And uh, um, uh, that's really a, a good thing to, to have in your arsenal as well, in your, in your toolbox, especially again with brain injury patients. Um, it's, it's one of the best tools you have for them. And there's other things we can do. And uh, um, uh, the optometrists uh, in your part of the world are starting to become like uh, optometrists here in, in, in the States. We just can't get enough education. We're always looking for new methods, new techniques that we can use to help our patients get better. And, uh, and uh, the more you know, the more you just wanna know more. So hopefully I'll give you some things to, to think about. So some thoughts on prescribing. Um, Strabismus and amblyopia are binocular problems. Um, a lot of the eye care field treats it as a monocular problem where they give the maximum prescription to correct a problem and they do a lot of patching, um, which only serves to break down binocularity and, and does not change bad uh, neurological patterns that are, that are happening during the course of, uh, that have happened during the development of strabismus and amblyopia. Lenses do not correct the problem. They provide a stimulus and the patient responds. And lens and prism prescribing is not just, can be compensatory, but it could also be rehabilitative, again, as part of, part of a program to move your case along. And we do, we do a lot of selective occlusion uh, to complement uh, lens applications. Uh, again, we, we use it in esotropes, exotropes, um, and uh, um, uh, all sorts of cases, uh, binasal occlusion, as well as spot occlusion, other ways to, there are so many better ways to reduce double vision uh, than just putting a patch on, which messes up lots of other things as well. But that could be its own talk as well, talk about occlusion. Uh, lenses provide optical and spatial characteristics. Uh, prisms do as well. Uh, Prisms are great uh, optometric tools. They, they uh, one end of the, the prism uh, has a minus effectivity. The, the, the apex has a minus effectivity. The plus lens, the uh, base has a plus effectivity. Uh, there's cylindrical components. There are slant components where things get moved in space relative to things. So there's much more than just the benchmark opti optometric, uh, what you've taught about optical bench we used to call it in school, where you just trace rays and move things. There's so much, there's expansion of space, there's opening of periphery uh, that are part of lenses and prisms. We use performance tests to help us verify if the lens is improving. You'll see that in, I think, uh, my first case here. Um, I really love my retina scope. Uh, uh, I use a spot retina scope, but you can use a streak retina scope as well. Uh, but if you're going to do pediatrics, I highly recommend uh, a spot retinoscope. My near retinoscopy on pediatrics is probably how I prescribe for about 90% of the cases. And, uh, you know, I, I, I find far retinoscopy helpful too. You can use an autorefractor, but uh, I get different information when I do the retinoscopy as well. Um, different thoughts of prescribing. In many of your TBI patients, you may want to prescribe multiple pairs versus progressives. Often the optics are too complex for them to deal with, and they're not able to deal with the changes in the periphery. And again, I'm going to talk about some interesting prescriptions here. Um, a lot of the success depends on how well you communicate what you're doing with the parents and with the patients. It's not unusual for a child that has amblyopia with a uh, 
a big difference in prescription between the two eyes, uh, be anisometropia for me to warn the parent that in uh, several months, we were probably gonna have to change this prescription. So there's no surprises. Uh, so the parent can't say, well, you never told me, you know, I spent all this money on lenses. You didn't tell me it was gonna be changed. So it's, it's really nice when you could prepare them at the very first visit and say that lenses are part of the treatment and that just as uh, therapy needs to be adjusted as the child's visual system changes, um, the prescription on the lenses may need to be changed as the, uh, the child moves through the program. So the prescription you start with is not necessarily the prescription you end up with and communication is key. Um, the goal, this is um, something from Dr. Streff. Uh, the, you want the least complicated lens that provides appropriate conditions to guide the patient's visual performance. Uh, we really try to minimize differences between the two eyes, and we'll show you a couple of cases where we, we've done that with lenses. Uh, we really work towards also equalizing accommodative demands at near. Again, um, the behavioral model we have is a lot of these problems started out as problems dealing with near space, and eventually they move out to all distances as well. And uh, full prescriptions can reduce system flexibility. So we have a lot of patients who've come in, they, they're wearing um, the full cycloplegic um, plus prescription that the previous doctor found, um, and they're miserable. It's just not, there. There's the, you've taken a very dynamic system and now you've made it static. And this child can't move between distance and near and can't make adjustments, adjustments. And they often have a lot of perceptual issues besides just having uh, reduced acuity due to uh, the anisometropia. Also, they end up with these huge differences between the lenses and they're just unable to, uh, to fuse. And uh, we'll talk about options there, even with something like a Shaw lens, once you get above a certain amount of anisometropia, that doesn't work well either. So um, that's for, uh, we, we're not gonna talk about Shaw lenses today. We'll give you some different procedures and techniques, but uh, again, um, when in doubt, under correct, we have some rules of thumb here we'll, we'll talk about as we go. And again, here's a quote from uh, my mentor, the late, great John Streff. Uh, People can respond in the direction of the corrected optical change when they have the flexibility and freedom to do so. So again, you want to avoid those full plus prescriptions, those full anisome prescriptions. Um, all they'll do is lock a patient into a, a pattern that's not working well for you. Obviously, they're in your office because what they have is not working well for them. And uh, um, we'll talk more about things. I think I got a prescription, a, uh, a lecture, not this Saturday, but the week after. I think I'm going to talk about um, prescribing for patients that have cylinder and uh, prescribing for astigmatism. And this rule really goes well for that. That's a, that's a fun talk. Well, We'll do that. So let's let's do let's learn through cases here. And uh, this is this is KM, and uh, she came in with some interesting stuff going on here. So, um, and we'll talk about how we used prism in a case with high plus lenses. So she's a, a four and a half year old girl. She came in wearing glasses, and look at what she's wearing. She's she's got some. Uh, some high plus here. She's been diagnosed with accommodative esotropia. Her acuities, this is her, actually her best uh, corrected acuities are, are like 2080 OU and uh, OD, OS, OU. And she can't see far objects. That's kind of her biggest complaint from her and her parents that she can't see things. But she also has a, a, a history. She was in foster care in uh, until the time she was 18 months, she was adopted at one and a half years of age. And uh, they know she did not get very good perinatal and, and prenatal care. Um, she is an avoider of close work. So um, I don't know how the school system there is by you, but at five years of age, they start school uh, here in the United States. and. Um, it's going to be a problem. She's very distractible, inattentive. She's really, you know, the parents are saying she's, she's an ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity child. 
And if you want to make her unhappy, all you need to do is put her at a desk and ask her to do drawing or coloring and she will just cry or throw it at you. Very, very difficult. And she's just not going to be ready with, with all this happening. She's, she's going to be in poor shape when it comes to school. So now let's talk about um, uh, my testing here. And uh, so I did cover tests. I verified the accommodative esotropia. You know, without the Rx, she definitely uh, turned in. And that was that right eye was the eye that turned in. But, and she was, of course, uh, even though she fused, um, she, she was generally aligned with her prescription, she still had an esophoria. Um, my near retinoscopy showed a little more plus. So I'm finding a little more plus, but again, I'm kind of leery and hesitant to bump up plus just because I measure it, okay? And uh, she's obviously been bumped up enough over the years to have this high plus. So um, subjectively, again, I got something very similar to what she's wearing. I talked a little bit earlier, a few slides ago about performance tests. So I have, a, I have some puzzles that are very simple, just some shapes, a square, circle, um, um, cross, and uh, um, she had a lot of trouble. She really wasn't even using her eyes to guide what she was doing. It was really trial and error. She went by feel almost, and sometimes she'd look at what she was doing. Um, we have the copy forms test. And again, I'm not sure what tests you're doing perceptually, but this is, uh, um, the, the copy forms is a standardized test of seven shapes. Uh, it's got a circle, cross, square, uh, triangle, divided rectangle, and uh, vertical oriented and horizontally oriented diamonds. So, um, and she could only do uh, a circle and a cross, which it puts her at about a third, a three to four year old uh, level. So she's several years behind at this. And again, she just didn't even want to do it. Uh, I tried some prisms. I maybe got a change, but I said, let's, let's do some some therapy here and see if things improve without changing her prescription. Because again, I was finding mostly lenses similar to what she was wearing. And uh, I gave some home-based vision therapy. I, we gave some, uh, some motor and reflex work. We do a lot of motor work, especially amblyopes and strabismics. It's a head to toe problem. So we'll do a lot of creeping, crawling, rolling and, and reflex work. And we did syntonics as well. And uh, said, come back in a month and see how you do. And just to show you, here's one of our circus puzzles here. So that's, that's a standardized test. Uh, a lot of people now use the divided form board, but uh, this is an old test still available. And it's really good for, uh, for kids that are about four, five, six years of age to see if they're using their vision to lead what they're doing. Can they cross midline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really, really great test. I, I love it. I get, I, I can find out if they're, per, they're using their peripheral vision or not. I, I get to see if they're a lefty or a righty, you know, things like that. And below is the, uh, the copy forms. So this child is, uh, we're doing it on a slanted surface, which is recommended. And, uh, and they're doing the square here. So again, I will often do this test and often repeat it with lenses and see if I get performance improvements. So they came back two months later. I, I honestly want to say here, these were not the most um, compliant parents. You know, when you're dealing with children, you're also dealing with parents. And, uh, <laughs> and some do what you ask them to do and some don't. And so I said, come back in a month and they come back in two or three months. And I say, I want you to do this at home. One, every night. And they said, well, we did it every night for a week or two, and then we kind of stopped. So, so I, I really don't think they did much of what I asked them to do at home in terms of the home therapy and even the syntonics. Um, so I said, well, then I'm going to have to go next to lenses and prisms and, uh, and see what happens. So I spent more time with, uh, with prisms this time. Uh, again, I kept coming up with about the same prescription, but about two base down OU um, seemed to do a little better. We tossed bean bags and balls, and she seemed to now time her catching better. 
her balance seemed a little better. We had her go up and down some steps and she seemed a little more secure. Um, and, and her father actually spoke out and he thought it was very obvious that the child did better with, with the low base down yolk prisms. And uh, um, he, you know, parents know their kids, don't mess with parents, they do know their kids. So, um, so we went with this, we prescribed the high plus with the two base down, said, come back in a month. They came back in three, because this is just the way the parents are. I could have predicted this by now. And there were just tremendous, tremendous improvements across the board in everything. Uh, hand-eye coordination. She now writes her name. She barely could write a circle before, and now she's writing her name. Now she doesn't mind doing desk work, and she's showing interest in uh, relearning to read and write, which is good because she's going to be starting school um, in a few months. And the acuity has really improved greatly. She's gone from 2080 to 2050 in the right eye, and from 2050 to 2040 in the left eye. So uh, cover test, a, a little less esophoria here. And, uh, and now the copy forms, she did the circle, the cross, and the square. And uh, she was able to do the circus puzzle, which was almost impossible for her last time. Uh, uh, she could now do that with just a few false starts. And we said, you know what? We're doing well. Let's just watch you. So why don't you come back in three months? So they came back in eight months. This is, I guess, it's kind of a running joke. Sometimes you learn the most from from your failures. This was kind of a vision therapy, not very successful. So it forced me to, to think about other ways that I could help this patient. And, uh, um, and so they came back eight months later and they are just so happy. She is like now gone from being the worst reader in the class to possibly being the best reader in the class. She's gone from being quiet and shy to being very outgoing and volunteering to, to do things at school. She's reading. She likes to read. She now takes risks, you know, playing on different playground apparatus. Um, again, I don't know what you have in other countries, but we have different slides and seesaws and monkey bars to climb, which she hated to do before. Now she just loves to do it. And uh, They wanted to make sure we kept her with, uh, with the prisms. They were afraid if they went to another doctor, they wouldn't get that. So uh, they came back, great student, great reader, great motor skills. Um, and uh, um, you can see what I, I found refractively, but again, I don't like to push that full plus. She was just doing, this is don't mess with a good thing. We've got a prescription that's really wonderful. You know, if she's worried about the lenses when she's a teenager, she could get contact lenses. The parents really don't care. They, they're just happy with how well she's doing. And we left her in uh, the base down prism. Since this has happened, I now have many, I frequently give one to two base down in high plus patients. What's high plus? Basically anything three or more, plus three or higher, I will trial frame with one or two base down and do some performance testing, such as copy forms, ball or beanbag catching, uh, and puzzles, or just even just walking. Um, a walking rail is a great activity to, uh, to check how somebody's doing as well and see how the balance is. So um, I, will, I will prescribe one to two base down frequently. I think uh, the optics to this, if you want to get into the optics, I. I think there's a lot of distortion and high plus lenses. Um, just if, if, you're, if you're watching me, I'm just gonna slide down my glasses. It is incredible the number of high plus kids that walk in with the glasses down their nose and they're peeking over them. And I think that there's uh, some number, number one, many of them are overprescribed and we need to cut them back and uh, we do that too. Uh, and number two, uh, I think they've gotten, they're, they're trying to avoid some of the distortions on these lenses. I think the lower half of the lens has some base up characteristics that might be affecting their security and periphery. And uh, putting low amounts of base down seems to help them organize space much better. So I highly recommend you try that in some higher plus patients.
especially ones that are not moving along as well in the therapy room or not responding the way you'd like. Let's get into another technique here. Um, I got two cases on this, and then I got just a, a couple of short cases afterwards too. This SDR, he's an 11 year bo old boy who has no previous prescription. He's really struck, came to the office by, uh, referred by another eye doctor. Um, he's having trouble with reading and writing. He's 11 and he still can't ride a bicycle. Schoolwork is really a problem. It takes forever, it takes in two hours to do what should be 20 minutes of homework. So he's really struggling. And what did we find? We found out that he's basically an undiagnosed anisometropic amblyope. And, uh, um, you know, some guys sneak through, maybe on a good day he gets 2040, but he didn't for me. Um, you could see his prescription here. He's plus four with sill and he's plus a half with a little sill in the other eye. And he's definitely got acuity issues. And, um, and somehow he has squeaked by for years and nobody's sent him for treatment of, or diagnosis really of his amblyopia. So uh, I did my book retinoscopy. I saw a little brightening of the reflex with a plus one ad. And I elected to go with a technique we're gonna talk about called a monocular ad, okay? This is a, a great technique. I prescribed this. We'll talk about this as we go, but let me show you what we did and then I'll talk about the, the, uh, the theory behind it. But uh, again, I saw no improvement in acuity from once we got beyond a minus two. So I did that instead of 350. And I cut the plus back significantly in the hyperopic eye, but I made up for it with the bifocal in that eye. So I, I cut the difference between the two eyes down and, and I made up the difference in the bifocal. The bifocal, the ad always goes in the higher plus eye. It's a can counterintuitive, but again, this is equally the equalizing the accommodation and you can verify that with your near retinoscopy. So he did this within a, a, few, a month. So these patients really were compliant <laughs> and came back when I asked them to. Um, Within a month, he's riding his bicycle, okay? His acuity maybe is a little better, maybe is a little better, no big changes. Um, and here we added some uh, syntonics. We did some syntonics and that picked us up a little more acuity in the, uh, in the left eye. And we did, uh, again, you could see things are changing. His, 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 and this sometimes things get worse before they get better. Um, his retina is showing a little more plus, a little more sill, though subjectively he's pretty close to where we started. We did a little bit of roll patching. That's called R-O-L-E, right, odd, left, even. Remember we said uh, amblyopia is a binocular problem and the studies show that even the eye with good vision has issues. So we would patch for 45 minutes a day alternate, alternating right eye on the odd days and left eye on the even days for 45 minutes, just a little bit of patching. So today is what? Today is the sixth, so it's an even day. So we would patch the left eye today just for 45 minutes and do whatever you're doing, eat a meal, do some drawing, coloring, uh, whatever. And we discontinued the syntonics at that point too. So now they came back six weeks later and they're doing much better. He now is starting to read better. School is getting better. And, uh, um, and his acuity is coming up. He's come up to 2040 here. And, uh, and subjectively, actually he's at 2030 with a little more sill. So I go, this guy is still changing. So it's hard to be patient, but you have to be patient when you do stuff with lenses and prisms. Um, sometimes sitting back is the best thing you can do. And I'm still getting some fluctuations. So now they came back five weeks later, they're doing really well. Again, he's wearing that monocular ad lens and uh, the acuity is now 2030. And, uh, um, and I'm seeing a little now, a little reduction in cylinder. Ah, look at that. And we're getting 2025 acuity. And I decided to end up with unequal ads based on my near retinoscopy. Again, I still, I'm trying to keep the distance as little and ISO as I can. And 
keep the accommodative demands as equal as I can up close. And then six months later, things are really stable. He's got stereo now and is doing very, very well. And uh, it affected a lot of things here. So again, uh, decide how much sill you need, use the minimal sill you need to do the job. You should wanna cut the difference, look at the difference between the two eyes. So here is um, about two diopters, four diopters of an ISO. So let's, let's ignore the sill. That just makes, we'll, we'll just look at, let's call it a spherical case. And you wanna cut the difference here. So here you would have no trouble putting about two diopters more plus than this. So this could become a plus 250 and, and giving them a plus two add to make up the difference at near. Uh, again, this guy has already moved along the case. So you had a higher add before and, and I cut that back. So uh, minimize the difference at distance make up for it at near, put the add in the more plus I. So again, cut the difference by about 50% if you can on the ANISO. Also, if you could push the plus up as high as you can in the other eye. So if they don't mind another quarter or half of plus and don't complain, that also will reduce the ANISO and you could always change later on when things improve. So uh, really, really good technique. I got another one here to show you just so you see how this works. This was a patient that had exotropia and uh, uh, let me see here, yeah, MB. She was an 11 year old girl. Uh, she came in for therapy mainly for cosmetics, okay? Um, excellent student, um, you know, good achiever, does everything well. She's kind of a high honor roll student at school. She's an achiever, uh, parents uh, very good and supportive, uh, but she's got this, she's a divergence excess exotropia, I mean, and it's very obvious. And the eye turns almost all the time, um, doesn't have diplopia as these cases generally don't. Uh, and cosmetics, you know, she's, she's 11 going on 12. And now, you know, how she looks in pictures and things like that uh, uh, is becoming a concern for her and her parents as well. So here, here's our findings. And again, sometimes we learn a lot from cases that need a little help along the way. So she's got myopic anisometropia. The eye that turns out is, uh, I think that's, yep, yeah, left eye. Right eye turns out. Um, so, uh, and you can see she's got that high minus in that left eye, okay? And she's 24X, so I was able to get, sometimes you can't get these findings because they suppress so well. And she takes some, uh, she, she takes a little bit of, of plus at near, and, uh, uh, but it was still tough to do duction testing. So she's myopic, she's got that right exotropia. And, uh, and we decided to just treat, you know, cut, make a, a OU prescription with an add OU and let's do VT. And I think this is something a lot of you would have done. Let's give her some ads, see if that helps. Saying, wow, that's not a lot of an ISO, let's not worry about that. And this is one of these cases that, you know, you get a little frustrated with because they're, they're just, the, the, some of these divergence excess cases are very stubborn. And, uh, um, and so she really, though she could now do a lot uh, she could fuse and give me findings. She doesn't suppress nearly as much. Um, I'm still not happy with how she's doing here. Okay, she, we're kind of at a plateau. Her eye still turns out um, most of the time. This is again 25 or 30. Maybe that's even worse than when we started. Uh, her fusion ranges are not as good as I would like to see considering how much therapy she's done. Usually at least we could get these numbers up even if when they walk out of the, the therapy room, they still trope and turn out. So I said, let's try a monocular ad. And again, we want to cut the difference between the two eyes, which we'd cut in half. And we're gonna put the ad, this, this is the part that drives everybody nuts. We put the ad in the more plus I, the less minus I, which is in this case, the right eye. It sounds backwards. Everybody wants to put that plus one ad in that minus I, 
but then you end up with Plano and Plano at near, and you're basically back to where you started uh, in terms of prescription. You've, you've managed to go nowhere. And uh, you got to put this ad in the more plus I because now you're equalizing the accommodative demand at near. So think accommodation and accommodative stimulus. And that's what you've done here. So, because now this side's looking through a minus one, this side's looking through a plus one, you got a two diopter and ISO, and now you've equalized the accommodative demand at near. And this, this prescription did wonders for us. So uh, we, we, we took a little break from therapy, we did a little bit of stuff at home. And then uh, she came back three months later and now she's no longer exotropic, she's exophoric at near. And uh, she's got a little bit of intermittent XT at, at near, I say it's exphoric at distance, maybe a little bit uh, intermittent XT at near. But look at her, uh, an ISO has really come down. She was like a close, minus uh, two-ish here. And she's lost about half of her an ISO. And look at all these numbers have come up here. So this lens without therapy to as much or more than I did in therapy. And uh, um, I have seen this happen. This was really dramatic. I've had a couple of cases come down in minus. This one is probably one of the best ones I've seen. And cosmetically, they're really happy. So I ended up giving unequal ads, again, based on my near retinoscopy. And she did really well. And she gets compliments now on how good her eye looks, which is really important because now she's a 12-year-old teen and social and cosmetics are important uh, to her. And uh, she's now exophoric at distance and near. I'd like the NPC to be better, but uh, um, uh, but look at this. The aniso is almost gone. And uh, and I prescribed just a small amount of base in prism. Um, I probably could have gotten by without it, but I felt with this poor, you know, she's still very exo, that just giving her a little bit of base in would make a huge difference here. So. Again, I gave this an equal ads OU because I couldn't really justify unequal ads anymore because she's really doesn't have the anisometropy anymore. So again, um, cut the difference at distance. You actually have an easier time with the myopes because you usually end up with one eye close to plano at distance. So they don't really care that they're undercorrected in the other eye. They, they, they tend to be monocular anyway, but uh, um, uh, much of the time, they let that eye trope uh, in those divergence excess cases. So it's almost a little easier than when you try to bump up the plus on the hyperopic cases. And some may complain that things are a little foggy. So you got to be careful. And we were able to give equal ads, and she just did so well. And uh, she was just stable here. And you know, we've had follow-ups, and um, she she's doing well. And look, the the exo came down. She was seven exo before, and now she's three exo. So she's continued to improve. So she did need therapy, but we were able to accomplish, really do what we needed to finish this case by, uh, by using lenses and using that monocular ad. Very powerful technique. Uh, Dr. Streff has lectured on it at uh, COVD, and he even did a B-scan um, ultrasound. Uh, he presented on a case where he actually measured changes in axial length uh, after prescribing a monocular ad. So... Uh, that's pretty cool. I'll talk just a little bit uh, about a few different kinds of cases here. Um, we, we use a lot of lenses and prisms and combinations, as I mentioned. And Dr. Rick Collier, uh, the late Dr. Rick Collier, he passed away not too long ago, um, out of Texas in the United States, had something he called binary lenses, which is real uh, low-powered yoke prisms with a, a syntonic twist we kind of called it. So it's a combination of, of, uh, of yoke, very low powered yoke prisms and very, very light, very, very mild tints. And um, this is basically what he did here for the patient who is ESO, and this could be your esotropes or ESO fours. Um, we frequently give one prism diopter of base down OU and, uh, and we'll give a, a pink or rose 3% tint, which is minimal tint. It's kind of like dip it in the tint and you're done. Um, and uh, we find that to be very helpful. This is really, really good 
for the, those headachey patients who don't seem to respond to anything, but, uh, but seem to be a little bit ESO and they're just very uncomfortable and, and complain of chronic headaches, especially under fluorescent lights. So they do, they do very well, the esotrope, ESO4, um, regardless of whether they're high or low plus, um, I give them a little bit of base down and a little bit of a tint and they just seem to be much more comfortable. Um, the one underneath uh, the, for the exo patient, this is something we do very frequently with our brain injury patients. Um, we'll do a uh, one prism adapter uh, base up with a, uh, a blue 3%, you know, sometimes I go a little darker five or more. Uh, but again, I, I find that I don't need to go with the heavy tint on many cases. I come in a lot of patients. In fact, I find are wearing very dark tints and uh, I lighten them up and, and they're, they do just fine. Uh, but a one base up with a slight blue tint, really, really beneficial. Um, I have a lot of patients who immediately, they'll call me up right away and they say, I can go to the market again now. I'm not so light sensitive under the fluorescent uh, lights anymore and, and they function better. So again, uh, once upon a time I avoided base up prism. I just, some people told me to avoid it, but I find uh, very small amounts, especially on, on TBI patients can be very, very useful and improving comfort. Okay. Dr. Collier has done some other things too. I have not done this as much, but uh, occasionally do it. Uh, Dr. Um, Hans Lessman in, in uh, Pennsylvania does a lot, a lot of this. And there's a few other docs, Dr. Wiley out on the West Coast of the United States does this too. But uh, for, for verticals, they'll put one base down OU. Sounds a little odd, but I have done this. I actually have a, uh, a uh, if you go to the COVD um, website, uh, for they have posters from last year's annual meeting. I, I have a poster that was supposed to be at last year's meeting before it got canceled on a, a post-surgical hypertrope at, that I gave one base down OU to, and they did much better than with compensatory prisms, and, uh, and the vertical eventually went away with after therapy. But uh, one base down OU with a green or an amber tint, and for attention issues, which is a lot of our learning-related cases, a uh, one base down OU with a, uh, uh, an amber uh, or yellow tint. He likes the, the yellow tint. And uh, uh, I've, I've occasionally given, for kids that are really hyper and attentive, um, one or two diopters base down can be, can be very helpful in those cases. Seems to slow the kids down. It they, they changes their perception of space and they have more time to get from here to there. So they may not be as out of control. Okay, but again, you don't really know until you trial frame it and, and see how it goes. We actually have these, these prescriptions made up in, uh, in lenses that we could just put on the kid and then do some performance testing. So we'll have these, we'll, we, we, uh, we work with our lab and we've made up some testing lenses. Uh, you go into my vision therapy room across my seat from where I examine the patients, I have a counter and I have a uh, uh, about a dozen different prescriptions that are commonly used, raising from low plus to low prisms to these binary lenses as well. So something you guys may want to play with and look at. So, um, and lastly, we'll talk about uh, um, a, a, a TBI case where prism was was very useful. So, because it's really a prism strab case. So. Um, this was a 13 year old girl, Courtney, and yeah. she was she was knocked down, knocked down at school. Hello? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we're almost done, almost done. Then we'll take some questions. Okay, um, so a 13 year old girl who, who got knocked down at school and, uh, and hit her head. Uh, I don't know if she hit her head on a step or on the floor but uh, she, she ended up like, being diagnosed with a concussion and she ended up with uh, like a, a near, near, near uh, vision, near reflex spasm. So she developed uh, intermittent esotropia that was variable and could alternate in the different eyes. She developed a high myopia. Uh, high myopia, I, I think she measured um, 
at times it varied from five to six dioptics of, of myopia. She was blurred all the time. She had severe headaches and her pupils were, were dilated too. So that's that near, near triad is that's your, again, it's parasympathetically driven process where you converge your eyes, your pupil constricts and you, your accommodation goes up. And so when you look near, you do that. And when you switch from there to far, now you diverge, your pupils, um, your pupils enlarge and your, um, you, your accommodation goes down. You uh, not quite a cycloplegia, but you, 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 you do negative accommodation. You go from accommodating to not accommodating. And that's, that's sympathetically driven. That's part of your actually fight or flight system, which is again, part of the visual stress phenomena that uh, why many, so many of our kids develop near point issues. But she, she, had, she was just locked into this near, near triad, um, you know, just this, uh, the, the pupils dilating, accommodation just totally out of control and then in esotropia. So I got some pictures here. So this is Courtney and you could see this, she could look at you like this and now her right eye is turning in. And then, oh, she made a nice movement to the right, but then she looks at me again and now her left eye turned in. And if you look closely, you could see her pupils are really dilated. You got a big bright light reflex from my flash from uh, my camera. So, so she was really, really messed up. So she could be, this was an alternating high angle esotropia. She had double vision, she had blurry vision. She could not function well uh, at all. Uh, this was not, I didn't get how many, uh, this was probably three or four months after her injury and she's just not getting better. And, uh, and then we said, you know what, before we start therapy, again, I try a lot of stuff and, uh, um, Let's try some prisms. So um, we, we, I start, I, again, I really like for ESO base down prism and see what happens. And uh, I have all different amounts of prisms. I started at about two diopters and I went up and at five diopters, I got this response where she looked left, look left, look right, look left, and now looked at me and wow, look how straight she is, okay? And she, she said, everything is single here. And uh, so here, let's look at the beginning again. Trope, trope, and now straight. And uh, so this trial framed, um, we found it was very specifically exactly five diopters base down that gave us this response. And uh, um, she, was, she was very happy. Um, we ended up making a pair of glasses in regular eyeglass frames with Plano and, and Five Down. We did therapy with her. Um, it was very, very slow. And to be honest, she kind of cleared out after probably about two months of therapy. She just, the problem went away. She was very happy, actually. Her, her mom called the office uh, late in the afternoon and asked us to stay open so that Courtney, Courtney insisted that she come to the office and show us her straight eyes and that we had cured her. And uh, um, uh, the other thing is that she, they were going to one of the big cities um, when we prescribed the glasses, they went to uh, Boston to a big ophthalmology department because uh, their pediatrician assist, insisted it. And they, they look at her and they said, well, we don't know what Dr. Fox does but you need to keep seeing him because he's the one that's helping you. So I thought that was pretty good coming from ophthalmologists to generally uh, talk people out of coming to see us. So that was really a big feather in my cap. So, uh, and then, and now she's back. She doesn't wear any frames, lenses, et cetera. She, she refracts to uh, low plus, like plus a quarter, plus 50, and she's totally symptom free now. And uh, yes, uh, would she have responded uh, cleared up on her own, maybe, but look at what we did for her with lenses and prisms. We were able to help her function and, and get through school and be so less stressed. So 
So let's give a little summary. Uh, lenses and prisms can be critical components when you see amblyopia and strabismus cases. Uh, look at them at not just compensatory, but therapeutically. And uh, prescribing should be based on the effects upon visual behavior, not simply what is measured. So just because you measure plano and plus four doesn't mean you should prescribe plano in one eye and plus four in the other eye. That very well might be the worst thing you can do. Um, and uh, you should look at what's happening. Uh, you should try to do performance tests and, uh, and be patient and communicate what you're doing and warn the parents of changes in the future. So thank you here. So that's my, that's my talk. I'm going to stop my share. Oh, we got a good, we got a good crowd. We got a good crowd here. Thank you so much, doctor, for a wonderful session. So we are moving towards the second round, that is the discussions round. And I'm going to pick some questions from the YouTube first. And then I will come to the Zoom. Uh, the okay. first question was, I also posted you directly on your uh, chat section, you can see also there, but I'm going to read for you. In the first case, having I plus prescription was the base down prisma induced by the decentering lens downwards? Well, um, there, there's quite a bit uh, of, of induced prism. Um, you can have as much, I tell you, you, you get off center, you could, have, you could have two or three diopters, depending on how high you go, uh, of, of induced prism in lenses on a plus lens. There, there is, I measured once, um, there's a kind of bifocal that's not very popular anymore called an Ultex bifocal. And it's basically um, ground into the bottom of the bottom half of the lens. And it's, it's basically like the top half of a plus lens. And, and I measured in a plus one um, ad that there was two diopters of induced uh, base down prism in, in that lens. So, um, you know, you can calculate the, uh, the, the amount, but, uh, uh, and, and by the way, that's a great lens to use also. It's just hard to get nowadays. And it's tough to even tough to even get it. Uh, you know, we put kids into Trivex, and it's it, I don't think Trive it's made in Trivex, um, so we we've had to get away from that. But um, uh, you know, induced prism. You know, I've played with it, and, and you could go to, yeah, just to, just take take a high plus, especially also take a a high plus uh, if you use to have them in your therapy room, if you have a flat versus a curved front lens you'll see that there is a cylinder in the, um, in the curve top that you're able to measure on your lensometer. So have some fun with that, play with that. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. And there is another question uh, from the Ananta. He is asking for what is the extreme is uh, that we can prescribe, prescribe such omlipic therapy and can you briefly, uh, briefly brief about perception logging? Right, say that again. Okay, so what is the extreme is that we can prescribe, uh, prescribe for the omlipia therapy? And can you briefly uh, brief about the perception logging? So there is a <laughs> two question. So what is the extreme is that uh, can be prescribed for omlipia? What is the most that what that can be prescribed? Yes, stuff I'm going to share you. Okay, so you can see now in the chat box. Okay, just a second. So you want to know what performance tests I would do to make a decision? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to look in the chat. It's much easier for me to read these chat questions. <laughs> oh, what's the extreme age? Yeah, here they are. So yeah, yeah easier to me to read these. Um, what's the extreme age that can be prescribed such amblyopia therapy? I have done this in adults. Um, I probably have had a few people in their 20s 
um, that I've prescribed, uh, that I've done lens therapy with. Uh, uh, again, uh, I will, uh, you always get easier changes on young patients. Um, I, I have, uh, we have strabismics coming in of all ages. And uh, um, of course, uh, you know, once they're presbyopic, that changes everything. But as far as non-presbyopes, uh, I have done unequal ads and monocular ads in adults. Uh, so uh, um, I, I'd much rather do it in a kid. Uh, you know, that kid was 12 years old and has probably went to a lot of other eye doctors would have been told, um, uh, would have been told it's too old and he can't do anything about it. So I was sort of glad he had never been prescribed before. So then I could get the prescription I want on him. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, doctor. So there is a more question if you scroll above the screen. So can you see the question on the chat section? Okay, so yeah, so I can go through these questions here. So. Okay. What's the logic? I'll go through these. Uh, what's the logic behind base down prism and accommodative esotropia? So, anyway, um, prisms don't just move an image up, down, left, or right. When you prescribe low amounts of base down prism, it moves space up, but it also moves space out. It acts almost like a plus lens without changing the focal point of anything or changing the clarity of anything. So, so it moves things up and out. It gets them de-emphasizes central, emphasizes peripheral. And again, these patients tend to be the high plus. They're really locked in. They're esotropic, esophoric. And uh, a plus lens will obviously move them, you know, help reduce the eso. But if you combine plus with uh, low amounts of base down prism, it moves them out. If you go too high, um, it seems to lose that perceptual effect of, of emphasizing the periphery. So you want to stay low. That girl that had the head injury, that five, that's like the highest I've given in cases like that. Usually I can prescribe two or three base down and get that straightening out effect on, on those. I've had only a handful of cases, but I've also had some people who've heard me lecture and have uh, emailed me that they've tried, you know, two base down uh, on some of those uh, post-concussion esotropes, and they find that they, they do align. So, or they get much more aligned. Um, let's see. You know, so I'm, I've sort of touched upon this already. First uh, case having high plus Rx was based on prism induced by decentering the lenses down. Um, I. I actually prefer to get lenses with the prism ground in, okay? I, I, again, I don't always have control of it if they go elsewhere, but I request prism to be ground in. This gets very complex. Prisms, prisms are not, though they may measure the same on a lensometer because they're measuring just a single point. Uh, once you get into prisms, you get away from thin lens optics to thick lens optics. The optics totally change. The mathematics of the lenses totally change. And even though you might measure the same at the center point in front of the eye on, uh, with the ground, ground in would be the same as decentered, there is a difference on the periphery and the other optical effects of the lens. Um, so people call me up and say, you know, it's the same. I, and I say, no, you know, it's really not that hard to do. You're surfacing this lens anyway. Um, you know, they, they would, you know, they would rather not surface the lens. They can just decenter it and get the optics. It's not the same, even though the center, that one center point in the middle, all the peripheral optics are different on a decentered lens versus a, uh, a ground in lens. So Get it when you can. You can't always. You take what you can get sometimes. Um, uh, but uh, but talk to your lab, and, and you know it, it's basically just like grinding a lens. It's all computerized now. You know it's not that hard to do. They just don't want to be bothered. They want to give you a, at least here in the United States, they just want to give you a stock lens off the shelf because they make more money on it. They don't want to have to, you know, work 
to 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 surface a lens for you as a custom lens. So, as far as uh, the the base down for the spasm of the near triad, we did a lot of therapy. Um, with we did a lot of stretches. We did a lot of nasal to temporal stretches. Um, we did a lot of movement and body work. Um, we did some we did some binasal occlusion. We we did a lot and. You know, we helped her a little bit. And I think part of it was, I think we sped up her recovery. I think we should look at it as a complementary therapy here. Um, I'm not sure we actually cured her because she signed up kind of was at home at school and her eyes just kind of popped straight. So there was a recovery that might've happened on its own, but maybe that would have happened six months or nine months later. And uh, if we could help speed up the process, why not? I mean, you do that when you get physical therapy for a hand or shoulder or a leg, it's gonna clear up on its own if you do nothing, but, but if you could have it happen in a fraction of the time, why not? So, and uh, performance tests. Um, again, I, I like, I like, I do, I tell you my favorite is actually uh, two things I like doing. I really like beanbag tossing, so I'll, I'll be, six, eight feet away and I will toss a beanbag and I will see how they catch the beanbag. Very often, a lot of these kids, especially I find these high plus kids, they have no idea where space is. They throw it at me and it, it may hit me, it may, they may think I'm close, they may think I'm much further. And then I will trial frame uh, plus lenses and I will trial frame, um, we have a kit that has elastic so I could put it over their own glasses using some of those prism goggles. And, uh, and I, will, I will repeat that with uh, various amounts of plus and various amounts of prism. And it's, it's really cool when all of a sudden, you know, you put two base down and now they catch it. And the parent says, my kid can never catch a ball. My kid can't catch anything, you know, and, uh, and they start catching it. So I really like getting them moving, just even them walking. We'll have them walk up and back even if you have to get into a hallway out of your exam room and you'll see just the stride of the legs is longer and they're more confident about their walking. So, um, but that's my favorite. Uh, that's what I do. So now I got another one here. Uh, how are you prescribing cases of high plus with cylinder more than two uh, and children with GDD? I don't know if we have GDD or is that must be ADD. I think somebody typed it. Uh, or uh, attention deficit. Um, this is this is a whole nother um, lecture. In fact, I got one coming up in ten days. But um, you know, number one, if they've never won sill, I have to see how much the cylinder helps them. And uh, so, um, if the acuity stops them, if you know, um, I probably won't give more than two on a first prescription. Uh, I also, even on a high plus, I have this rule. This is Rob's rule, okay? Um, don't make changes more than two diopters at a time. So even if I have a patient come in who's plus five OU, he's not gonna get more than plus two OU on that first visit. And the same thing with cylinder. If they're measuring plus four or five cylinder, you're gonna have to really push me to give more than a minus two sill on that first visit. And very often when they come back, especially like that hyperopic case, they're plus five or six and I give two, they come back three months later, they're not measuring that plus five or six anymore, they're measuring plus four. And I'm going, wow, this is pretty cool. I don't, they're no longer that high a plus anymore. So uh, again, don't make changes. That, that, that's one of my favorite rules is don't change things more than two at a time if you can help it, okay? Even if the acuity isn't where you want it to be, um, it, you know, um, and, and I've done this with very, 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 very high plus cases. And they, they often don't end up with that high plus anymore. I've had plus eights end up at like plus five, just because I prescribed in steps and changed things two at a time. And, and that's just think about, again, the optics and the perception, they, they do so much better, so. That's another rule to go home with. And our last question here, what about pupil for head injury and based down and prism based down can balance the autonomic nervous system? Um, oh, definitely, definitely. Um, 
Uh, Debbie Zielinski has all sorts of stuff about how changing where the light falls on the retina affects different parts of the brain, including the, the, the brain stem and autonomic nervous system. Um, base down prism, one base down, two base down, really, really powerful. Um, I didn't think it when years ago, I didn't think they did much, but they are really uh, powerful. Uh, again, on the TBI patient, again, are the EXO on the ESO. Um, some of them do better with base down, some of them do better with base up. I know Dr. Stern is here. She has a saying, if you've seen one TBI patient, one brain injury patient, you've seen exactly one brain injury patient. So one patient can come in and do better with base down and the next one can come in an hour later and do better with base up. And uh, 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 again, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here on the autonomic uh, nervous system as well. That's why syntonics and I think the tints are so powerful. I think the, the, the rose tint gives us a, a little bit of a, a sympathetic system boost, very low, very mild, and the, the blue gives you a very, very mild parasympathetic boost. So, uh, and it's pretty safe, you know, um, and, and the patients generally like them. So very, very good. Okay. You guys had good questions. It's been a fun group. <laughs> okay. Okay, I guess these were the only question. So let's wait for a few minutes. See if anybody wants to ask the question. This is, I, I just want to explain, sorry I made you repeat things. This is, this is a new computer. My other computer died and this computer, I want to say, has a terrible speaker. Um, I'm going to next time use my headphones, okay? But uh, everything, yeah, it's not your fault. My, my computer died. I didn't have a lot of time and uh, I didn't think to check the speakers before I bought it. <laughs> Doctor, I can see the few questions over there. So, can you check the chat, chat box? Doctor. I said that's why it might be easier if you see a question on the on the live stream. You might want to type it into the um, chat if if it's another question because um, I just I'm having a little trouble hearing you, and it's not your fault. It's my computer. Okay. Okay, so here, um, well, we got a few questions. You're quick typers. <laughs> Is there particular tints for lenses, uh, uh, color code? Uh, again, you know, um, again, uh, I said, I generally stick to Dr. Collier's rule. Generally for people that are EXO, I find they do better with blue. And generally for people that are ESO, they do better with sort of a, uh, a rose tint, or many people use the FL41, that's a specific BPI tint, that's kind of an amber rose, uh, roses kind of tint. Um, but again, you have to, you have to trial frame these. Um, there's a kit out there, I forgot who sells it, of, of it's, it's all sorts of flippers um, uh, of different tints, and uh, it's something that people may want to invest in. I have some different tint samples I use. That, I, that fit into my, I had some tints made in trial lens size so that they, they're little planos with light rose, light blue, light green and amber, and they, they fit into my trial frame. So I had them made the, the standard uh, trial frame size and they fit in. So it's really good for, for trying tints. Okay, can we maximize the amount of yoke and amount of low prism as, as done like you? Um, yeah, again, start small. You know, you can get you can get some. You know, you might already have these prisms in your therapy room, or you could buy them through a company like Brunel, and get a few different pair. Get a one base down, a two base down, maybe a, a four or five. And you could rotate them so you could use them for base up and base down, and uh, just just start small. Try not to make changes more than two at a time. And, and go from there and walk, get the patient up, especially if you're prescribing prism, really good, get the patient up and walking, put them on a walking rail, toss a bean bag at them, see how they do. Okay, 
there's that small amount of astigmatism in KM was significant that, yeah, I, I, I prescribed it. I thought it was helpful. You know, she seemed to like it. We trial framed it. I probably could have gone by a very small amount, especially relative to her high plus um, sort of doctor's call. And, uh, and we trial framed it and she did well. So yeah, that's the, I couldn't remember Chadwick. Yes, Chadwick Optical here in, in the States sells sort of, I think they call it their brain injury kit, but it's got like a set of like four flippers and each of them there's light and dark blue and light and dark uh, rose and, and a couple of others. So it's really good as a trial that you could put that in front, but you could make up some of these yourself too. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat this here. So, um, oh gosh, let me see something. I'm going to try something. Bump, bump, bump. Let me see if I could do this. I'm going to try. <laughs> try a whiteboard. So, if you have somebody who's plano, pardon my writing. This is really tough with the mouse, and somebody who's plus five. Okay, that's, that's the right eye, and this is the left eye. Yeah, so I'm gonna, this is my first time on a whiteboard, so you're watching history being made here, okay? So this, I will try to plus, push up a little bit. So very often, you can, you can get them up to like a plus 50. So that's probably what I'm gonna end up with in this eye. This is the eye, more plus, this is gonna get the bifocal, okay? So now I've created a new anisometropic condition. So now there's four and a half diopters of difference between the two eyes. So the delta equals 4.5. Okay, so, so now that's the difference. So I wanna put half of this on the top and the other half on the bottom. So half of this is going to be plus, and again, it's the difference. The difference between the two eyes is, for, so the, that's gonna be plus 225. And I'm gonna make this probably a plus two. I might, I probably don't wanna go above a plus two add on this. So plus 225 is really pushing it. So I'll probably end up with about a plus two add here. And again, if it's a first prescription, I might even bump this down to a plus two add. So this is, this is the right eye lens. This is the left eye lens here, okay? So again, a quarter is not gonna make a big difference here. So you could have gone plus two or plus two and a quarter. But you could see that now they're reading through, you know, through a 425 versus a, a 0.5 here, pretty close to what their, their refraction is here. So again, push the plus on the, the less plus I, find out what your difference is, give half the difference to the top, the other half difference to, to the bottom here. Okay, so um, hopefully that helps here. Uh, brand new whiteboard. Ta-da. <laughs> that actually worked. That's pretty cool. Okay. You got know to play with it. Okay. And, and it's a big leap of faith to do it. It just sounds so counterintuitive. People want to put that equalize the plus, but you got to realize there's such a vast difference of accommodative level um, in here. Uh, Lens of choice. My favorite used to be, again, the Ultex uh, lens, but that's not made in shatter resistant. So I will, um, I, end, I generally use a flat top and do pretty well. Flat top 25, 28 generally works well um, on that. So um, different tints in different cases. You guys are going to have to take a syntonics course. Uh, Again, the red stimulates sympathetic, which stimulates divergence. Blue stimulates parasympathetic, which stimulates um, convergence. So that's based on syntonics. So that's why we do that. You guys, if Kathy Stern hasn't done a syntonics course, maybe the two of us will do a syntonics course for you guys. So we'd love to.
<laughs> okay, you guys asking really good questions. Thank you, that monocular ad, it, it's a leap of faith. You're gonna have to play with it. It took me probably, I played with it for a year till I really felt comfortable with that, okay? So it, it's, it's really, it's, it's not automatic, okay? And uh, you're very welcome. This has been a great, you guys are, rest, you guys are, uh, I'm very impressed. Uh, I think Dr. Stern will agree with me that you guys are really thinking at a very high level here. So I'm very, very impressed. I know uh, vision therapy is really growing by you and, uh, um, um, and I'm so glad to be part of this. And I got two more lectures coming up and, uh, um, and we'll have fun with them too. So uh, this okay, was probably, uh, yeah, okay. All right, I, I guess you have gone with all this question, right? <laughs> Okay, can you hear me, doctor? <laughs> yes. Okay, so hopefully, I guess you are clear with my voice now. So I guess yep. we have, yes, I guess we come up with the uh, end and we answer all these questions. Again, if anybody have the question, we can also discuss in the further session. It's, uh, we are going to have uh, two sessions more. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. And doctor, would you like to add uh, any uh, good notes before ending the today's session? All right, doctor. Doctor, do you do you like to share something, your experience or anything before ending the today's session? Before doing the what? <laughs> I guess, doctor, you, your 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 computer. Okay. I lost so, you for a second. Yeah. Okay, doctor. I think I froze. Okay. Um, yeah, no, just thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I look forward to, to lecturing to you again uh, in the future. I really want to meet you guys in person sometime, but uh, we'll have to get through this pandemic first. And uh, <laughs> thank you. And thank you to, to you guys, uh, to the people that organize this. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, have a great, well, have a good evening. I guess it's near bedtime for you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. So here with I announce the close of today's session. Hope to use you all again to, uh, on the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you, be well. You too, have a good day. Have a great day. <laughs>